Hello, my beautiful doves. Welcome or welcome back. My name is Mina, and today we're going to be talking about kawaii. the kawaii industry. Also, I just got my hair done last week, and I would like some input on this color. It's definitely redder than I was going for. I was going for more of a natural red, and uh. Oh no! The box said it would be a honey mist auburn! Honey, you missed Auburn big time. I haven't done a fashion color in a really long time, and I felt like I was over that phase in my life, and now I'm back in it, and it feels a little weird. I don't dislike it. I actually kind of like it, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Anyways, about this topic, I'm not really sure what compelled me to make this video. Nothing really happened that made me think, oh, I should do a video on cute stuff. But you know how we like to talk about aesthetics and culture on this channel, and I feel like the word kawaii is kind of taken for granted in the West as just like a cutesy trend in Japan, or as just an integral part of weeaboo vocabulary. But there's actually a lot more to it, and I just can't wait to explore with you all. For anyone lost on what kawaii means, in basic terms, it's the Japanese word for cute. For a more in-depth definition, Sherry Lieber Milo and Hiroshi Natoni define kawaii as describing playfulness, warmth, cuteness, eliciting maternal instincts, and even feelings of empathy and compassion, and is usually used to indicate small objects like infants and young animals, young women who look lovely, and fancy goods such as decorations and toys that please us. Rather than just being an adjective, kawaii has exploded into a whole industry, producing thousands and thousands of consumer goods every year. In 2012, New York Daily News published an article with the headline, Japan's Pursuit of Cute Spawns $30 billion industry. What this headline refers to is Japan's character licensing industry, which actually only makes up a segment of the total kawaii industry. But let's get into the history. I also apologize in advance for any possible mince pronunciations from this point forward. And also, I guess from this point before, because I think I probably pronounced those names incorrectly. This video is sponsored by Function of Beauty, a company that makes personalized, dermatologist-tested, paraben-free, sulfate-free, vegan, and cruelty-free hair care products. I took a little quiz before ordering to create a shampoo and conditioner that catered to my unique preferences, something that could help control my greasy scalp, but still add moisture to my colored hair. I've changed my shampoo so many times and I feel like all the ones I've used previously left my hair with this waxy residue that I didn't like. I'm so glad I got to try Function of Beauty because I feel like my hair is just a lot smoother, a lot more nourished, and I think the color in my hair is also preserved a lot better. And I also love their aesthetic customization options. I picked the light green color because I felt like it matched the all eucalyptus scent I chose. I also love Function of Beauty because they deliver on a schedule and if you live in a city like me, you know how exhausting it is to do errands because you have to walk everywhere, so this just makes it way more convenient. Now it's easier than ever to try Function of Beauty's top rated signature hair duo. You can get your first custom formula 50% off using my link below. The roots of kawaii go back as far as the 11th century via Se Shonagon's Pillow Book. This was a book of observations recorded by a court lady to the Empress Consort Teishi in Heian, Japan. In the book, there's a section detailing things that are considered utsukushi, which is kind of like an adjective that shares a lot of meaning with the modern word kawaii. Such things include a baby face written on a melon, children wearing baggy kimono, chicks, sparrows, doll furniture, bird eggs, and glass pots. Etymologically, the word kawaii originates from the word kawahayushi, which uh, means embarrassed and was used to describe a sense of sympathy and pity towards weaker members of society, such as children. Over the years, the pity meaning vanished, and now today, there are no negative connotations for the word kawaii in Japan. Aesthetically, kawaii icons usually have round faces, large eyes, and a small body, very baby-like. Conrad Lorenz's theory of baby schema, or kinshen schema, <laughs> is normally cited to explain why kawaii things are so appealing to us. 
According to him, visual features like a high forehead, big eyes, oversized head, and full cheeks trigger positive feelings and a desire to protect and care for the observed object. And apparently, this affects women more heavily because it triggers our maternal instincts. So now we know that humans are biologically predisposed to like cute things, but what triggered the cute industry that we know and love today? According to Sharon Kinsella in her paper Cuties in Japan, the emergence of the modern term kawaii in the early 1970s coincides with the beginning of the cute handwriting craze in childish fashion. In 1974, large numbers of teenagers, especially women, began to write using a new style of childish characters. By 1978, the phenomenon had become nationwide, and in 1985, it was estimated that upwards of 5 million young people were using the new script. It's important to understand that before this handwriting craze, Japanese script was written vertically with very thickness per each stroke. The new style, known generally as marumoji, was written laterally with unified thin lines per stroke. Teenage girls, the major practitioners of this handwriting style, would also insert random English characters and cartoon images. Overall, this handwriting was pretty difficult to read for traditionalists. If you're an English speaker slash writer, think of it as bubble handwriting or a popular girl handwriting. Kinsella says that the right to left to right, yeah, left to right writing format and the inclusion of English characters suggest that teenagers were rebelling against traditional Japanese customs. So kawaii culture came about as an underground literary trend and spread from there. Not only were girls writing with a cute style, they started also incorporating infantile slang in their day-to-day -day lives. For example, sex was referred to as nyan nyan suru, which directly translates to meow meow. <laughs> Kinsella is firm that cute culture originated among the youth, but notes that the consumer boom, which started in the 1970s, led companies to capitalize on the cute trend. Sanrio created the first Hello Kitty product, a vinyl coin purse, in 1974. At this time, the company was experimenting with cute designs, printing them on a category of products called fancy goods, aka stationery, toys, gimmicks, toiletries, lunch boxes, towels, and other personal paraphernalia. As far as 70s and 80s kawaii fashion goes, white, pink, or pastel were popular color choices. Clothes were often frilly with puppy sleeves and ribbons. By the late 1980s, cute fashion was more androgynous. Rather than nursery colors and frills, women opted for naughty hats, dungarees, and tight sweaters. During the 80s, the kawaii craze kind of fell out of popularity, but then um, in the 90s, that's when the Japanese yen fell drastically and major banks filed for bankruptcy. Companies scrambled and ended up going back to kawaii as a way to increase profits again. For example, we got Tamagotchi and Pokemon, which both relied on the cute character-oriented marketing rather than traditional storyline marketing. And this time around, companies not only targeted the youth, but they also targeted men and women who were part of the initial kawaii craze in the 70s and 80s. As Lieber Mila writes, in an attempt to adjust their brand by targeting other age groups, the company Sanrio, for example, has developed a fresh line of products that include adult-oriented goods such as personal electronics and jewelry. The success of these adult-targeted products was reflected by the fact that by 2000, the core Hello Kitty customer base was mature women between the ages of 18 and 40. So the next question we're tackling here is why do people like cute things? And I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier about our biological predisposition, but why has that enabled this industry to get so big? First of all, this is global. People all across the world are drawn to cute things, not just the Japanese. In America, we have Walt Disney Animation, which first based its cute, joyful animal cartoons on an idealized country culture. What I mean by that is that in the West, during the turn of the century, which is when industrialization and urbanization started to increase dramatically, some philosophers criticized modern society and urbanization as having a spiritual poverty. Rural communities, on the other hand, were stereotyped as being simplistic and innocent and spiritually intact. 
This has some major roots in racism, by the way, because a lot of these philosophers felt this way about cities because in cities, white people were intermingling and coexisting with ethnic minorities. But anyways, in the early 20th century, Disney capitalized off this urban nostalgia for country life and repackaged it into a cutesy animated aesthetic with dancing and singing woodland animals. And while Disney did inspire Japanese animation and comics, Kinsella notes that there's a major difference between Disney cute and Japanese cute. Historically, like I said, Disney cute is rooted in an idealized countryside, whereas Japanese cute is rooted in an idealized childhood. In 1992, Kinsella conducted a survey in Tokyo asking young adult respondents to describe the way they felt about adulthood. <laughs> adulthood versus childhood. She writes, although some respondents gave positive appraisals of adulthood, describing it as a period of freedom and potential, the great majority of respondents described adulthood as a bleak period of life. She noticed that the most common impression of adulthood was that it had too much responsibility to society, to family, to work, um, which I totally understand. Young women, even more than young men, desire to remain free, unmarried, and young. Whilst a woman was still a shoujo outside the labor market and out of the family, she could enjoy the vacuous freedom of an outsider in society, with no distinct obligations or role to play. But when she grew up and got married, the social role of a young woman was possibly more oppressive than that of a young company man. In this sense, we can deduce that young women, and even teenagers and children who are kind of aware of this impending doom of adulthood would resort to cute things as a form of rebellion. In the West, we perceive rebellion as more aggressive, like with the punk movement or even the scene kids. There was kind of an aggression compared to these pastel pink dreams of some of the teenagers in Japan. And that's not to say that Japan didn't have subcultures that were way more provocative or political. It's just that this cutesy stuff was also a form of rebellion that we see way less of in the West. Atsuka Eiji wrote about how young girls in the 80s decorating their rooms into kawaii fortresses was a form of rebellion against the confining roles they were assigned in modern society. He writes, included in the image of the girl's room is the undeniable fact that the girl is trying to make a space for herself separated from normal life and reproduction. It's also important to remember that kawaii culture originated via young girls' handwriting. And at the time, educators, parents, and other adults uh, deemed this handwriting as a deviant social practice. Some schools even banned it. But cute things can also make us feel comfortable and warm and act as like a self-care practice. Libra Milo uses the term shadow family to describe the cute items and characters that people create connections with. We live in a time, especially with the pandemic, um, where social interaction between people face to face is an increasingly fleeting concept. And honestly, I consider myself to be a pretty social person. Like I try to go out and do things with people, but I still have tons of friendships that are just perpetually online because either the friends that I have are too busy or like we can never figure out a time in our schedules where we match up or because they moved or I moved and we don't live anywhere close to each other. In this case, which I think is pretty common for millennials and Zoomers, consumption of cute things makes a lot of sense to replace the intimacy that we're missing. Like, Kumamon triggers the sweet, sweet oxytocin that we all need to live. <laughs> An example of this uh, blend between cute and mental health is the subculture Yami Kawaii, which directly translates to sick cute. This style, like the name says, combines cute and sick aesthetics, so pastel colors but with bandages or syringes or blood. The concept of Yami Kawaii is about expressing deep feelings of sadness, but in a cute way, <laughs> and is thus an aesthetic outlet or a release for some people dealing with mental health issues. In an interview with Christine Yano, she talks about the empathy gap in today's society. She says that objects may be considered promoters of happiness, solace, and comfort. When a society needs to heal, it seeks comfort in the familiar, and often the familiar may reside in cute, like teddy bears for firefighters. 
When Japan's island Kyushu suffered from the 6.2 magnitude earthquake in 2016, three weeks after it happened, the character Kumamon visited the conventional hall of Mashiki, a town that was hit hard. Children who lost their homes to the earthquake flocked around him, hugged him, and took pictures. Something I also noticed about popular Japanese mascots like Kumamon and Gudetama, they have very blank faces. Even though their mouths are creating some kind of expression, it's not like a super clear smiley face like Mickey Mouse, for instance. Hello Kitty doesn't even have a mouth. But the blankness of these characters' faces adds to the power that they yield. Sanrio's Nakajima Seiji says, Without the mouth, it is easier to imagine Kitty Chan shares whatever feeling you have at the moment. If Kitty Chan was smiling all the time and you'd just broken up with your boyfriend or something and were very sad, the last thing you'd want to look at was a grinning Hello Kitty. Without a mouth, you can imagine she is sad with you. Of course, nothing can exist in our society without a group of haters. <laughs> in Japan, conservative adults feel like the cute industry is leading to some kind of moral panic. They believe cute things encourage young people to be selfish, to put off work and responsibility, to not want to grow up. And honestly, I don't really care about that point of view because I think young people are pressured in our society to overwork themselves anyway. Work is not that fun. The cuties are right and they should say it. But cuteness is also strongly correlated with indulgence and overconsumption, which I can understand. With the way that corporations have monetized off of cuteness, remember, we're talking about billions of dollars here. It has led to overconsumption, which has a negative environmental impact and also a negative impact on our wallets. The capitalist nature of kawaii marketing is also kind of scary. In Asia, there are Hello Kitty amusement parks, restaurants, and hotel suites. Eva Air flies seven Hello Kitty themed jets, which carry images of Hello Kitty and her friends throughout the interior from the pillows to toilet paper. It seems nice for people who are into Hello Kitty, but remembering that it's a ploy to literally get you to buy into the hype, I don't know, it doesn't sit right with me. It's kind of like how in Disney World, there's just a bunch of hidden Mickeys everywhere. Same effect. <laughs> Similarly, governmental institutions and police departments have resorted to using cute mascots to uh, soften their image and distract from the <coughs> war crimes. Rather than posing as an authority figure, the government wants to let you know that they're your friend. It feels a little dystopian. There's also a problem with cuteness being linked to sexual perversion, which is something I talked about in my Japanese schoolgirl video. But you know, it needs to be said, again, because it's important. I'm not saying Hello Kitty created the pedo. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm not saying that teenage girls shouldn't be able to indulge in cute things. Adult women who play up the cute factor are in a morally gray area to me. But anyways, it's hard not to see the correlation between the growth of the cuteness industry with the way that pornography has developed uh, over the years. According to Layla Madge, studies of male denote a distinct switch in female type preferences between the pre- and post-war years. Commonly accepted perceptions of female attractiveness in the pre-war years were largely maternal in character, with the woman playing a motherly role and the man that of the child. In contrast, the post-war years are marked by a distinct preference among men for childish women in what has come to be referred to as Lolita complex. And there are disgusting ramifications, for example, stores that sell schoolgirls used underwear, and tell Telephone clubs where adolescent girls can talk to mostly older, mostly male clients for money. There's also the problem of princess culture, which is the fear that a lot of older millennial parents have. It's basically the fear that Kira Knightley expressed in 2018. She's banned from seeing certain uh, children's movies, right? Yes. What are they? Cinderella. Mm -hmm. Banned. Uh, because, you know, she, she waits around for a rich guy to rescue her. Don't. Rescue yourself, right. obviously. Little Mermaid. I mean, the songs are great, but do not give your voice up for a man. Hello. <laughs> wow. Update, she has since lifted the Disney ban. Over the years, people have been concerned with whether or not little girls dressing up in princess clothes or absorbing these messages that a man randomly starting to dance with you in the woods is appropriate behavior is damaging for their development. Some feminists are concerned that little girls are being told by the media that being nice and pretty are the most important things 
to being a girl. So while I wouldn't say that Gudetama necessarily reflects those messages, I can see how people may be anxious about uh, younger girls being pressured into partaking in hyper-feminine, cutesy interests and aesthetics. Brian Brunner, in his 2002 article in Japan, Cute Conquers All, cites, Japanese feminists charge that all this cute chic is really about the cultural domination and exploitation of women in the country. It encourages girls and young women well into their late 20s to act submissive, weak, and innocent rather than mature, assertive, and independent. Also, all this talk about youthfulness does push a glorification of being young versus being old. And like I've said millions of times, hopefully at some point I'll believe it myself, that getting older is not a problem, especially for women. Hiroto Murasawa of Osaka Shoin Women's University talked about how in Japan, single women in their 30s are sometimes referred to as leftover Christmas cake, aka they're no good after the 25th. And I don't know if there's an equivalent saying in America, but I feel like that's a common sentiment in almost every culture. And I'm not saying that owning cute things or liking cute things is inherently problematic, but I just wish there was more of a cultural interest in the hobbies and characteristics associated with older women. I don't know what those hobbies could be because the first thing I thought of when I was thinking of adult culture is literally filing taxes. But I think that's a problem in and of itself. We as a society don't focus enough on the benefits of getting older than 21. And of course, there's the racial fetishization that occurs in the West with these very specific cultural exports. Lest we forget Miss Avril Lavigne's Hello Kitty music video, complete with the expressionless robotic stares of her Japanese background dancers who act more like background props. Anna Lee Nowitz wrote for the San Francisco Bay Guardian in 2002, cute is a consumer item, a mainstream aesthetic. Asian philia is at the heart of America's obsession with cuteness. Cuteness, at least as it's consumed in America, reduces all of Asian culture to its more precious, infantile, and fluffy form. Writer Angela Choi echoed similar sentiments. Hello Kitty is such a symbol for Asian women. We see her as this kind of mouthless kitty, like a lot of the stereotypes of Asian women. That they're submissive, they have to be demure, and they have to be polite, they have to be X, Y, and Z. It fits very much into that image of Kitty. She doesn't have fangs like a proper kitty, she doesn't have a mouth, she doesn't have claws, she's not really a kitty, she doesn't even have real eyebrows, and she can't really express herself. She's just kind of this placid, docile character, and I think she encapsulates a lot of the stereotypes of Asian women. Okay, that's all I have for today. <laughs> Let me know in the comments what you think about the kawaii industry, what you think about, I don't know, Hello Kitty, what you think about anything, what you do for Halloween. <laughs> and I hope you liked this video. Thanks again for just stickering around and st why can't I speak English today? Um, thanks again for spending this much of your day with me and I'll see you next time. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye.